The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Money GPS is an Australian fintech that has created leading digital advice technology to meet the unserved advice needs of the 90% of working Australians who cannot afford traditional advice. Users take a fully client-led digital journey with access to hybrid human advisor support across superannuation, investment, retirement and insurance topics. Money GPS offers a turnkey solution to financial advisors, helping to future-proof their business by engaging non-advised clients, enhancing referral relationships and achieving scale through a technology and personal advice solution. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I have the pleasure of speaking with Daniel Wilson, financial advisor and partner at Strategic Wealth. Daniel, thank you for joining me this afternoon to have a chat. No worries. Thanks for having me. No, we. Uh, I just messaged you on LinkedIn this the, this morning. You'd been at the FAAA event yes yesterday. Uh, we were we were chatting before we pressed record about how how big it was. How many people were uh, were along there? They claim 750, so it's a, a massive event. I think the room size is getting a bit bit tight for 750 people, but uh, it's good to see so many people in the industry there and bump into a few faces that you, you see along the way and catch up with them. Um, yeah. Did you hang around for long? Were you there for long? Yeah, it sort of kicks off around midday and then goes for about three hours. It's a bit of a panel discussion. Uh, it's all football talk, to be honest, which is right up my alley. Um, and then from there, you got a choice to... To kick on somewhere or, or head back to the office. Unfortunately, I was a bit boring and made my way back to the office. But um, <laughs> head back to it, was a great, it was a good day. Yeah, a couple of guys from my office went along too, and then they come and they came back at two or three or something in something in the afternoon. Yeah, I, I went a few years ago to it, and football chat is not really my uh, not up my alley. So uh, um, not, not yeah. my not my place to be seen. But it sounded like you enjoyed it. That's a that's a rare opinion for for a Melbourneian. I know, I know exactly. Um, uh, um, there's always a lot of jokes going around my office about uh, about what's going on. Although my youngest son did Oz kick for the first time this uh, this season, just gone, and so there's a whole lot more interest in football in my house these days than what the, what there ever was. That's going to help with the uh, small talk with the clients if you've now got your a little bit of a ticket in. It does, it does. So, strategic wealth. Um, you've you've been there a while. By the looks, I was you know, just looking at your, your LinkedIn profile before. Just getting getting on to thirteen years with with strategic wealth. Tell us a little bit about the the business and and what you're all up to there. Yeah, so I have been here for a while. We're a financial planning firm based in Melbourne, so we're based at the bottom of Queen Street and just near Flinders Street. Hmm. We've been here for a long time in a nice old building. We uh, we often joke. I don't know if it's a bit of a myth that's been passed down the line. That's the first skyscraper in Melbourne. Um, so we, we've run with that a little bit. But um, yeah, we've got a team of 12 people Okay, uh, within the, that team. About six of them are advisors. One of them is a provisional advisor. Yes. So we are, we're a financial planning only practice. I know a lot of the other guests on your podcast often have a accounting arm or a mortgage broking arm mm. within the firm. But it's something that we've looked at in the past and we've, we've actually tried our hand at it a few times. Yep. Uh, the mortgage broking side of things and the accounting, all we probably found along the way was that we're better at just focusing on one thing that we do really well and doing that well. I think it's very difficult to try and put your um, fingers in a few too many pies. Some people are really good at it and can do it well, but we found that for us, it was just better to focus on financial planning only yeah. and really focusing on the segments that we, we like to focus on. So Yeah. Like like with the mortgage broking bit, for example, was that was that one of you as existing advisors or someone that had said, okay, I'm going, I'm going to also be a mortgage broker at the same time, or was it a brand new person that joined to be a mortgage broker? How did you how how did you do that? Yeah, it's a good question. It was a an advisor from our team. Yeah, um, so there was a designated advisor that sort of took took the lead in that area. But again, it was just 
it was just a case of trying to probably do a little bit too much. Uh, we probably found the paperwork and the processes is something that you really need to put a lot of effort into doing it efficiently. Otherwise, you just end up spending a lot of time doing paperwork and administration and maybe you don't deliver the client experience that you should be delivering. So the business doesn't quite run as well as it might for others who are focusing on that solely. So that's why we've kind of landed back in this financial planning only space. Yeah, there was a there was another guest that I was talking to on the podcast a couple of weeks ago that the similar thing. It was a smaller business than than yours, yeah. but but also tried their hand at mortgage breaking as well as being the financial advisor, and quickly realised that that wasn't the way forward for for them. And much like you, just went back to financial advice. Yeah, I think when I going back to the start, when I started working here, we were sort of looking at this model where it was you know you get these younger sort of accumulators come in and. You do some financial planning work, you do um, the debt, you do their insurance, and you can kind of get this really holistic solution, yeah. uh, which was kind of the idea. We gave it a go, but we just found it very, very difficult to pull pull it all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who, who, are, you, who are you typically working with these days? Who's, who's, what's a typical strategic wealth client? Yeah, so we, we do work on a range of clients. Probably yeah. if we had to pinpoint it down to a typical client that we like to work with would be kind of like people with complexity. So it makes it really interesting for us to work with. Uh, they're often for professionals, executives. Uh, we do a lot with expats as well. So we find that a really interesting area, one that not many people kind of play in. There isn't, is there? Yeah. Yeah. Which I find can be quite difficult because when you're working with different other specialists, whether accountants or lawyers, it's kind of hard to find the right network for your client who who knows these different issues that they're having or they're experiencing. Uh, yes. I guess the other thing with working with SPACs that I find quite difficult is that it's not as easy just to jump on a technical webinar and learn a bit about the super contribution rules because mm. there's so many nuances that pop up along the way working with different situations and clients based in different countries, et cetera, that you can only really learn from experience. Yes. Just seeing something pop up or hearing about one client who had a friend who was also an expat who had this issue. So, they, so are they, are they, those expats, are they they're Aussies that are living in another country? They're in America or Singapore or wherever? Yeah, generally. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So you get some pretty uh, some interesting time zones that we dial in the meetings on. <laughs> you would. Um, and it's either late for us or early for them. And um, But it, it's cool because you meet people who just get an exposure to people do around the world and the different lifestyles people live and yeah. makes it makes it really interesting. And how do you is it is it is it more the kind of Australian based assets and Australian based affairs that you're helping with? Can can you somehow help them with stuff that's going on overseas? Like what what is it what yeah what are you what are you working on with them? Yeah we generally help with the Australian side of things. Yes. Um, okay. we don't often touch the international side of things. That's we sort of scope that out yeah. of our advice. Yeah. Um, but often it's Clients who are on expat assignment and they're eventually going to come back mm. to Australia and, and settle down. So it's helping them work out the different implications of that, what retirement looks like for them, where it's going to be, et cetera. So I find that really interesting. And then on top of that, we have a very heavy focus on retirees and, and pre-retirees. So that's that's probably the bulk of our client base gotcha. in yep. that space, which is yep. an interesting space to be in going forward as I've heard you speak a bit about uh, in the future with the intergenerational wealth transfer. So, that's- oh yeah, 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 that's it. You know, there's you know, you and I and every and everyone else in financial advice, you get these papers that get emailed to you about the whole kind of wealth wealth transfer that that's going on. Uh, I'm, I'm as I'm sure it is in your world, it's popping up a lot. You know, fifty or sixty something year old, you're doing some work with them and saying, oh, you know, we're doing all of this planning, but yeah. Mum or dad have a house in Sydney that's worth five million dollars, and we're going to get half of that. And so, all that completely changes your world in terms of retirement planning, doesn't it? I know, I know. Particularly, one thing we struggle with that is with insurance planning, and it's like in the back of your head, you know that these children of clients who may not necessarily be children, they might be thirty or forty years old, but yeah, you're trying to work out what level of insurance they need, and you look at the asset base, etc. But then you know, in the background, they've got a lot of money that's potentially coming to them down the track and most likely coming to them down the track. But we can't necessarily rely on that when we're doing work from our end. So it can be an interesting balancing act from that 
that perspective. Yeah. We I just said to you, you bring up an interesting comment. We uh, like a, a meeting of mine, client of mine that I had just just last week. The client bought bought it up. You know, we initially I think he's got you know, two and a half million of life in TPD or something like that. We you know yep. we'd, we'd been through the whole exercise when we took it out. He was young, didn't even have kids, had some some young kids, but but both his parents and his wife's parents are, are they're both very wealthy families. And he's now getting to a point to say, you know, we've been together for long enough. We've got kids together. He's kind of bringing up to say, if something happened to me, her parents would look after her and the and the grandkids. And if something happened to her, my mum's got enough money that we're going to be okay. Do I really yeah. need this much? And so he's, we're, he's keeping some insurance, but pretty drastically reducing it down because it's, it's like, I, I don't really need to be spending quite so much on insurance. There is family money that would come my way if I needed it. Yeah, exactly. And that's the re- reality that we know that that support is there down the track. But yeah. I guess as you you would know from our perspective, from a compliance perspective, it's hard for us to to document that or, or rely yeah. on that as a as a basis. So yeah. yeah. So can you talk about talk about your kind of journey through 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 the business? You know, I, I was particularly interested in talking to you because you have spent such a length of time with with the one business, like looking at the different roles that you've done. You know, we see it with a lot of some of our younger guys that are com- coming through, tend to bounce around a bit. You know, they'll I'll be a client service manager here, and then I'll apply for a job over there and get a promotion as a para planner, and then I'll apply for another job somewhere else and and get a job as an associate advisor. You're you're being through all of that by the looks of things with with the one group. Can you talk about the steps you've had in your career? Yeah, so probably probably on that, just going back to the start, one thing I find interesting about how people actually get into financial planning. Yeah, true. I, I just find it really interesting because throughout like my secondary school experience, it wasn't even a profession that was mentioned anywhere along the line. It was accounting, maybe economics. There was a business management subject on offer. And I just wonder how people actually get into financial planning. Like from my perspective, I actually got into it. Like I've been around it for a while because my dad is a financial planner. Right. Um, for the next Actually, three months he's a financial planner before he retires. He's retiring. Yeah, good. Yeah. So I've I've had exposure to it, and I've always enjoyed working with the numbers and that sort of thing. So I've just naturally been inclined to to be drawn towards it. Yes, but I do wonder how people actually get started in it. Um, so having said that, that's how I got started in it. So as I was working through uni, I studied financial planning, a bit of economics and accounting as well. And while I was doing that, I was doing a little bit of admin when I'm talking scanning document after document after document. We had a big compactus in the kitchen, which had just the racks and racks of client files before we moved everything to SharePoint. So I was a long, long day scanning. Um, yeah. That's where I started. And then after I finished my uni degree, I got to have some experience in the power planning role, which I was lucky enough to actually be doing the power planning role, but also being brought into client meetings quite early on. Yeah, nice. Essentially to taking notes for a while. But just listening and observing. And one thing I kind of picked up from that experience was that I knew I liked the the numbers side of financial planning, but I also really like learning about people and yeah. developing relationships, which I'd argue is more than more than half of the role of a financial planner is meeting with people, learning people, understanding them. That's kind of where I learned a bit about what's involved in financial planning and I really started to like it. But to your question about why I did I stayed here for so long. It's probably driven by the the culture here. Like yeah. I've always really enjoyed who I work with, and for me that was just such a high priority. Mm-hmm. Having said that, if I was to bounce around a bit, I probably, um, to, in all honesty, probably could have progressed a bit quicker. Mm. I probably could have jumped around in a few more roles, and um, which which I understand is perfectly a, a fine ambition. And I, if I wasn't happy, I'd be looking at doing that myself too. But uh, I can understand how people do jump around a bit because it can sort of help you take the lift a little bit more than, than taking the yeah. stairs and trying to get to a different role. Was there, uh, I imagine, in the, was there kind of the, the, the always the potential or the prospect for you to continue to move forward in in the business where you were? Because you know, I, I'm only getting to know you now as, as we're talking. I would think yeah. that for most people, if it became apparent for them that there wasn't likely to be a a growth path for them, or well, then that's when they're going to find something else to do. But maybe that that was apparent to you along the way. 
Yeah, yes and no. Yeah. Like in a small business, obviously, like there's a we're a team of twelve now. We we weren't always a team of twelve, but within that we had two power planners. Uh and then myself sort of came on as a bit of a power planner. So in reality, if those two power planners were kind of always ahead of me. And if they stayed there, the opportunity potentially wouldn't have been there for me to grow as much as I wanted to. So there is a bit of luck from that perspective that things do open up. But at the same time, I think if you work you find yourself with the right people who align with you, which I think is a really important thing. They need to align with you you ethically as well. You can almost kind of make it work one way or the other, yeah. uh, depending on each business's circumstances. So that that was probably the main draw card. But in, in ha- having said that, also there was a bit of a bit of luck as well in terms of mm. things opened up. Uh, yep. So you went from para planning then did to associate advisor. Yep. Did did you, you did you have to go through the professional year or, or were you a bit ahead of that? What what what? Uh, the- yes, and yeah, I did. I went through yeah. the professional year. I didn't actually have. To, I was able to be fast tracked and start from Q three because of yeah. based on the experience. Yep. Uh, which was handy. I found that reading through the, the description of the PY, a lot of the stuff in there is stuff that I've been doing for a while. So to be perfectly honest, from that perspective, I probably didn't feel the PY was a huge jump for me in terms of what I was doing on a day-to-day basis. Mm. But I'd imagine in a different world, if I came out of uni and started PY a lot earlier, following that sort of structure of the different quarters and what was involved, would be a, a lot, a really good experience. Yeah, um, is it exposing you to different things? Is it Q three or Q four where you have to write the advice and then kind of present the advice? Is that Q three or Q four? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Q three. Yes, Q is if you like you're already doing power planning, you're pretty much doing that already anyway, aren't you? And yeah, particularly like if you're going to the client meetings. Yeah, exactly. So I've been writing, I've been writing plans since about 2013, 14. So okay. I did my Hey, well, I technically about two years ago. So by that yep. point, I'd been doing it for a bit, and it was yeah more just a stepping stone into moving to more of an advisor role, which yep. is kind of the phase I'm in now. Yeah, and so how, you've been advising for a couple of years now, a year and a half, two years or so. Yeah, about about two years now. But yep. just based on what we we're talking about before, actually, in terms of having, we're probably a little. We've got a. We found ourselves in a situation now where we've had these power planners and associates come through and because we've all enjoyed working together we've stayed together yeah we're probably a bit a bit heavy from that perspective so we've got okay. three advisors who are either doing their um py or there's another advisor which started at the same time as me as a, an advisor so we're trying to manage how we continue to develop ourselves as advisors when the opportunity is potentially not there to go full steam ahead from that perspective at the moment mm. Do you do you have like some 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 growth plans or or, or things in order to do, do, is it like you need need more clients through to to help fill up the advisors that are coming through the professional year give them give them the clients to work with is it is that is that what's happening you've got some prospects on the way growth prospects yeah so there's obviously all the organic growth which has always been there and then I think one thing we've kind of haven't really pushed too much in the past which we can get better at is working with the existing client base and communicating to them that that we're open to working with more clients and yeah um so that's one thing we're trying to focus on uh the second thing we're trying to focus on is probably trying to protect our own our own brands a little bit as well mm. uh, you you're very good at it putting yourself out there and <laughs> um putting your content on social media <laughs> yeah I, I don't do it personally so i'm now sort of after seeing a few people speak and hearing a lot and getting a bit of advice i'm trying to step up a little bit in that that area uh, yep so that's one area. And then um, with the partner retiring at the end of the year as well, there's some opportunities for that client base that we've been working with and the younger guys have been taking the lead a little bit more on those clients. So yeah. we'll be able to get some development through there. But ultimately down the line, some sort of acquisition or something would be the big big leap where we'd get that nice. responsibility, I feel. Yep. And, and so, you, so you're a partner of the firm. Could, could you Can you talk through how that, played out for you because you know a lot of others are interested in the different businesses that they might work in is to how, how have others done it in, in in wherever they worked like how did it, how did that come about yeah it's it's a tricky one because there's different now we've got more people in the business everyone's got their own goals and mm. people are at different levels and there's more senior advisors here who some have been here from from day dot some have been here for 
uh, not as long. And then there's some younger people who have been here. So it's a, a balancing act of working out what's a fair allocation between the between the group of us. But I think from our perspective, we the the younger guys we have growth intentions ourselves. We're we hopefully we're all ambitious. So in our discussions, it's always been pretty clear that that's that's the goal we'd like to get to, and it doesn't have to happen tomorrow. But when opportunities arise, that's that's where our intentions are, and we really like working with everyone as a group. So. If that's something that can work, I think the senior partners here, Mike and Adrian, have been really good at acknowledging that as a group, we all bring different things and we've got continuity with each other. So we kind of help each other out from that perspective. But yeah, there's there's two senior partners and there's three sort of younger partners. So yep. that's kind of how we've come to that sort of balancing act between between everyone's yeah. interests. And did you, uh, did you, did you it, it, as, as much or as little detail as you're comfortable giving, but yep. Did did you guys have to did you did you buy that? Does it some mechanism that you kind of earn it over a period of time? Like how did the the ownership part? How, how did you fulfill that part? Yeah, so we've we've all bought in. Uh, okay, with businesses valued um, on a different with the formula of EBIT and revenue it's yep. a combination of the two, and uh, we've bought in in progressively over the last two years. We've had a tranche two years ago, tranche a year ago, and then. We'll, uh, we'll finalize that at the end of this year as well. So it's kind of been a, a phase out, a phasing period. But yeah, that brings different complexities as well because it's a bit bit daunting borrowing to invest in a, in a company where, yeah. um, I don't know, I, I always find it interesting that as advisors, we talk so much about diversity and the importance of spreading out your assets. And <laughs> at the same time, here I am getting all my income relying on this, biz- on this business, but then having debt taken out again against the business as well um i do find that a little bit of a contradiction but i guess you've got the element of control tell me about it i'm i'm grappling with that now like i own a bit of the business that 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 i work in there's the the opportunity to 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 maybe buy some more and and it's and that's i'm exactly that is rolling around in my head it's like you wouldn't tell your client to go and work somewhere, borrow all of this money to buy part of the business. Like it, like it seems like yeah. such a high risk strategy. Yeah, uh, you know, the financial planning businesses are generally quite profitable businesses, and it works out in the end, and then and all the rest of it. But yeah, certainly not a diversification play, is it? When your your income, uh, this ownership percentage, but then you probably borrowed money to to get the ownership percentage in the first place. Yeah, so you put your house up and everything. So yeah, I. I do. I do think about it a fair bit, but uh, at the end of the day, it's an opportunity which I kind of think is a really good one. And, yeah, and, and I, a lot of things you do, and if you're pretty comfortable with, I feel comfortable here because I've worked here for so long that I know all the ins and outs. I know the people really well, and I know the client really well. So I, I do feel pretty confident. Yeah, in and I reckon in what we're doing, here. kind of bringing back the um, the the mortgage broking thing that you were talking about before. As you, as you're explaining it, I think. It's, it's you spent so long working in financial advice and there was a business there already, you know, long established business with processes and all the rest of it. And then all of a sudden you try and jump into doing something that, that's completely different to what you've done before, albeit maybe a parallel kind of industry. Um, it, it's a little wonder that a number of advisors that try to get into doing mortgage broking as well, they, they have a hard time of it because they've got all of this history of doing the financial advice and their processes are all down pat. You need you need to go through that whole same exercise with with the new business line if you're going to do it the hard work. Yeah, hundred percent. It's uh, but some um, people do it well, so they do. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's impressive. So of, of all those different clients, like you, you know, you're talking about you know you you're having these conversations about you kind of you know, different partners and advisors and so forth, having your your different brands and so forth. You know, obviously all all within within the business, and you're all, you're all going to have different personalities and the like. Do you find that there's a particular type of client that you enjoy working with with the most? Like you were explaining before, the different types of clients that the business kind of generally works with. But mm. but do you, but do you as an individual have a preference as to who you who you like working with? Yeah, I, I would say that that pre-retiree, early retiree bucket, I actually really enjoy. It yeah, because you see that how hard they've worked for so long to build up what they've got, and they don't necessarily know how much they do have. A lot, yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah, true. So I kind of see it pre- it's pretty rewarding when you take a client from not really understanding 
their capacity to retire and what their retirement would look like to to quite often realizing they they can do it and they can do it do it comfortably at times. So I, I find that really um, rewarding to work to work with. But yeah, um, they're also just I don't yeah. But then the younger clients have a different challenge as well. They they've got aspirations to grow and start a family. And they've got ambitions to potentially borrow and grow their wealth. But I'd probably say from personal experience, it's, it's a it's more difficult to be a like the power planner associate type of role in those younger clients. I just feel <laughs> every year is in USA because there's a significant change and um, whether it's a kid or a home or a change of job or, or whatever it is, there's a lot more going on with, with that, that age bracket, which makes it harder for us to power plan. But they've also got a um, really exciting level of energy and enthusiasm and they're starting out on their on their journey. Yeah, you're right about you're almost starting from scratch every second year again, aren't you? I, like I know no. some of the younger clients I work with, I, and I know when we put in the request to our power planning team that they're going to be difficult because they've you know they've they've got all this stuff going on. There's debts, maybe they've got businesses and assets and all the rest of it. Versus the the kind of pre to to post retiree, a lot of that's complications wound down a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do you do you find that if, if you had clients and I had one earlier in the week, I'm interested in, in, in your take on this. You, you describe these clients that they kind of don't really appreciate what they have and what it actually means for them in, in terms of retirement. Do you do, do you give them? Have you found you kind of give them the good news up front to say, actually, I think you can retire, and by the way, this is why, and this is how we're going to do it. Like before you get to the advice, but to kind of. Give, give them the good news first, or do you, or do you string it out a little bit and you, and you tell them a little later on? Um, like the point where they probably realise that would be at our, in our process is at what we call the, the strategy meeting phase. So when a new client comes on, for example, they'll they'll sign on. We'll have had the initial meeting, then we do our data gathering, and then before we write a plan, we have a we invite them in for a strategy meeting presentation. Sure. And within that, we have a. A slide deck where we put together a PowerPoint, which is probably too long to be honest, but try to work on that. But it's about 30 to 40 slides. We start to work through all the strategies and different concepts within that deck. And then we come to the modeling, which is kind of where we deliver the, the good news. So yeah. if it is good news, but um, that's probably the way we do it. And then by the time they get to their actual statement of advice and plan presentation meeting, kind of feel like they're pretty well informed. There shouldn't be too many surprises at that point. Yeah. Do you find when you do that, that like strategy type meeting, mm. do you find, I guess, how, how, I'm interested to understand, how often does the, the resulting advice tend to be a little bit different to what you may be prepared going into that strategy meeting? Like, does you're, you're thinking you're heading down this direction and then something comes up that the client says and and you take a bit of a turn. How often does it does it change much? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll say generally it as a general, it doesn't change. It, the yeah. chances are it doesn't change because- I thought so, yeah. Yeah, but then you do get some clients who have strong preferences one way or the other or, or whatever reason they're, they're hell-bent on getting as much social security as they can. So you might work to tailor a strategy around that a little bit, but managing trade-offs with doing that as well. So I'd say generally- Clients are pretty good at taking advice, which you hope they would be, because that's why they come to you for all the advice. But um, as you probably found, a lot of clients often have their premeditated thoughts, which can be hard to hard to unwind a little bit. Yeah, yeah. the the hell bent on the on the social security bits and like one I had just at a review meeting before hmm. before chatting with you now, and and this particular client he he is brought up multiple times with me. My friends have. Spent all of this money in, you know, spending all of this money, and now they're getting an age pension. Do you think that's a good idea for us? Should we spend this? <laughs> You're going to have to get rid of four to five hundred thousand dollars <laughs> to get a hundred and forty dollars a fortnight in age pension. This doesn't sound great to me. If you want to do it, do it, but it doesn't sound like you have a good time on the way down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, it'll take some time adjusting. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, so what's what's next? What's next for you? What are you? What are you working on next? Where to from here? Yeah, so for he, from here, we're just now focusing on we've got one of the major partners retiring at the end of the year. So going forward, it's kind of a little bit of a new chapter for us and just betting down what that looks like. But then also working on just developing as as individual advisors. Yeah. Well, from my perspective, I, I want to 
continue to grow and develop and to advise in my own right. There's working with one company for so long, you kind of are in this little bit of a bubble. Yeah. And I'm fully aware of that, that I'm very much shaped by the people in this bubble, which they've been really good people to be shaped by. But I also like trying to start more and more to put myself out there and get exposed to other people in the industry and hear different thoughts about how people do things. And yeah, that's probably my my journey personally going forward yep. for the next meeting to short term. Listen, listen to the Ensemble podcast. There's a, every week there's someone to sharing their story. But yeah, that's that that's the that's the kind of the good and the bad part about being in in the one business for so long. I'm much the same as you. I've, in financial advice, I've only ever worked for the business that I work for. Right, um, but but a, a little while ago, ha- kind of had a similar re- realization that you've just explained to say, well, it's all well and good that I work in this business and there's some great things going on, but what else is out there? What are other people doing? What else can I? What else can I learn? And you've got to yeah get out to like the FAA events and and all of these other things to meet other people yeah. and chat with them about about what they're up to, and so you can learn a bit more. How, how did you start doing that yourself? Uh, it was just those events, going to those, mm. going to those kind of, a, going to those kind of events. Uh, any opportunity that I got to go along to something, I said yes, I'll yeah. come, I'll come, I'll come. And um, mm. yeah, I don't know. Just I just had this mentality for a while, and I still do now. Just say yes to if someone invites yeah. me to something or gives me an opportunity for something, like you know, doing a podcast. As you've said yes to do this, I just just say yes and see what happens and. Yeah, uh, and it just snowballed from from there. Um, yeah, spend, try and spend a bit of time outside of your business, and that's what we have trying to encourage a lot of our advisors to do. This the same thing. You know, it's a big business, doing some great things. That's all well and good, but mm. you know, f- f- to be a rounded advisor, you should spend some time talking to other people about what they're doing in their business and and see what you can yeah. learn. Yeah, I think that's really important because you can get stuck on this sort of hamster wheel in your own business and. Work's always going to be there. You're always going to be busy, so it, it's easy to not say yes and just get working away at your desk. But sometimes you just need to bite the bullet and just have a bit of a circuit breaker and go to a few things that you might not. Yeah. Um, say yes to a few things, a few different things like this podcast. <laughs> well, Daniel, thanks for thanks for joining me this afternoon. Pleasure speaking with you and getting getting to know you a little bit. I'll uh, look out for you at the the next event that's on somewhere around Melbourne, and we might cross paths. Brilliant. Thanks, James. I appreciate appreciate your time. Thanks, Daniel. Good to speak.